My talk today is about taking a look at some of the foundations of the algorithms that people have talked about either developing or using in this conference, and in particular focusing on the question of what actually are we trying to do with these uh, inference methods. So I'm going to start with just an introduction and overview that I expect to be pretty familiar to many of the people in the audience of uh, approximate page and computation and what you can do when you don't have a likelihood. Then I'll go through sort of some of the intuition behind a few different ways that people have thought of to evaluate how well these algorithms are doing. And then we're going to look at some really toy examples to investigate sort of are these heuristics doing what we think they are? Um, and from comparing them, how could that affect sort of how we think about developing algorithms in the future? Can that improve our inference? So just to set the stage, right, we're thinking of uh, problems like the one that Ruth talked about yesterday, where you have some uh, quite complicated mathematical model that you can simulate forward to, say, uh, run a simulation of your wound closing. Um, but the model is sufficiently complicated that you can't write down a likelihood. You can just take your simulated results and say, do these look like the data that we have? And despite that handicap, right, we still want to do Bayesian inference, where we want to find a posterior that's a combination of the prior and a likelihood scaled by the evidence. Now the sort of classic challenge uh, in Bayesian inference these days is that you can't actually compute the evidence. You only have the unnormalized version of the posterior. That is not the setting we are talking about here. This is likelihood free, right, where we can't even write down a closed form expression for the likelihood itself. Right. But what we can do, again, is simulate from it. So we can draw samples that are drawn from this uh, likelihood for any particular parameter values. And a classical way of doing inference in this setting is approximate Bayesian computation, right, where the process is you sample a parameter for value from your prior, you run a simulation from that to get some uh, simulated data, you then compare that data, uh, that simulated data to your true data, your x star, according to some distance function, and then if that the uh, simulated data looks sufficiently like the data that you observed, then you keep the simulation output. Now, obviously, there's lots of questions here in terms of defining what that distance function should be, what should that threshold be. Um, I'm going to skip all of those, though they are interesting, and there's plenty of work that's uh, worth looking into on choices of distance function, choices of summary statistics, choices of threshold. Just as a pictorial version of this, I'll follow this very nice tutorial by Tony and Stumpf. You're sampling some red point here from your prior. You want to find a posterior, so you simulate from that. Uh, that's your simulation results in green. You have some data that's the black crosses. And here you say, ah, our simulated results look pretty close to the observed data. We will keep that sample add it to our samples from our posterior. Then you do it again. You say, okay, this time our green simulation results look nothing at all like the data we observed. We'll say that simulation was no good. We'll throw that parameter value in the bin. You do this lots and lots of times. Right? You end up with a set of samples that are sa samples from your approximate posterior and another set of samples where the simulation result didn't look like your data and you're ignoring them. And this is, in theory, definitely works. It gets you uh, samples from an approximate posterior without having to write down a likelihood. It is generally computationally very, very expensive. Sort of the standard explanation right here is that in realistic models, you have a very high rejection rate. So you have lots of simulations where you ran the simulation, put in a lot of effort, and then found that you weren't actually getting anything like your data, and you have to discard that parameter. And so given that this is very computationally expensive, how could we make it more efficient? And so following that intuition, right, we have lots of rejected particles. That feels very wasteful. That's, we can go through a standard intuitive argument for what we could do to do 
better and have a more efficient algorithm, right? If we had more accepted samples, we have a better approximation to our posterior. So if the algorithm had a higher acceptance rate, right, if you had to simulate fewer times to get the same number of accepted samples, that should be an improvement. How do you get a higher acceptance rate? Well, things are accepted if they look like the data. You'll get simulation results that look like the data if you're simulating from regions with higher likelihood. So if you're simulating from a pyre, that's not necessarily very good, but simulating from the posterior, right, that should get you more uh, simulation parameters that are more likely to give you results that look like your data and should be an improvement, right? I think this is a fairly standard classical in intuition that you can find all over in the literature um, that I fi personally find very compelling that all of this um, sort of makes sense. But if we take a step back here and think, uh, before taking a step back, right, those, that intuition gives you sort of a score for how well your algorithm is doing, right? The acceptance rate. How many simulations n did you have to do to get the number of accepted simulations that form your approximate posterior? Right, one complication here when you go beyond rejection sampling is that often you end up with weighted samples. And it would be a bad thing if you ended up with right, lots of samples, but almost all of the weight is just on one of your samples, right? Then your approximation is probably not that much better than just having one sample. So there's a standard correction for this that adjusts for a different variation in the weights to give you an effective sample size. Um, and here, this formula will range from one if all of the weights, W, all of the weight uh, is on one of your particles up to the total number of accepted particles if your weights are uniform. Those are two candidates, but now taking a step back, what did we, what did we want to achieve in our uh, inference? What are some things that we might have wanted to learn from the posterior? I'm going to list here a few uh, candidates that I think are common to want to learn. Maybe you want to learn the posterior mean. Right? That's the expectation of your parameter theta, giving you the sort of central tendency of your distribution. Beyond that, one of the classic attractions of Bayesian inference is getting some measure of uncertainty. Maybe you also want the posterior variance. Or perhaps there's some particular property of your system, and you want to know what's the likelihood that there are the data comes from a system where this property holds. Right? You could write that as the expectation of an indicator function for the range of parameters where you have that property. And what you notice here is sort of many of the natural things you might want to learn about your posterior can be written as the expectation of some function of the parameters. And with uh, you a little bit more effort, it turns out that it's actually kind of tricky to write down something that you want to learn that in the limit where your approximation is pretty good cannot be written as the expectation of a function. So here's another candidate score for evaluating the algorithm. How well does our approximate posterior p hat, how well do expectations of functions that we care about match expectations with respect to the true posterior? And now this is, I think, a better grounded one uh, uh, score than the first two, but the first two are sort of intended as approximations to number three, and hopefully they would be good approximations. Now, not everything can be written as an expectation. There are other uh, examples. Here's just uh, one as the KL divergence between your true and approximate posteriors. That's sort of a standard way of right, comparing probability distributions in statistics. There are many others, and if you want to read more about them, you can go to the paper. Well, this will be enough for the talk. And again, the one that feels best grounded to me is this third one, the error in the posterior expectations. The first two ought to be approximations to that. The Kale divergence, sort of because it comes from such a different place, and my intuition is that that could very well be totally different, but um, we will see. So now given these uh, possibilities, 
let's investigate them in some very simple examples, simple enough that we can know exactly what is going on and maybe do some analysis. And I'm going to simplify this particularly by looking at di discrete uh, parameter spaces. Right? We don't have any continuous parameters, there's just k different hypotheses theta that we are considering. And now way, the way our algorithm would work, right, we simulate some number of times from each of those parameters. Some number of those simulations yield an output that matches our data. Again, here I'm skipping any considerations about what your ABC threshold is, what your distance uh, should be. I'm assuming there's some finite probability of getting exactly the data, though the data will also be discrete. Um, your approximation to the likelihood, well, there, it's hard to do better than the obvious one that, that your approximate the likelihood is the proportion of simulations from that parameter value that match the, the data. And then you have a total simulation budget, right? That's just the sum of the number of simulations you did for each parameter value. And our choice here of what to do differently with different algorithms is basically just the choice of these NIs. How many times do you simulate from each parameter? And so we want to know how does that choice affect each of these different scores. And for some of them, the thing you should be doing is straightforward, right? The acceptance rate, the effective sample size, these will always go up if you sample more from uh, parameter values that have a higher likelihood, that are more likely to give you um, the simulation output that is equal to your data here. Let's try an example here. We're going to look at just two hypotheses, right? K equals two. And here I have plotted uh, the mean squared error, so that third score, against the one parameter choice here, which is the fraction of your samples that you spent on the hypothesis that turns out to have higher likelihood. Right? So maximizing the acceptance rate in, in this example, you would want to always simulate from that parameter. You would be all the way off on the right here. And the plots I have here in blue, that is simulated results of the mean squared error of uh, a function. With two parameters, it doesn't matter what function, they're just different by a scale. In green, I have an analytic estimate of what that mean squared error should be asymptotically. It turns out to work quite well. And in the red triangles, or the red diamonds, that is a rescaled version of the KL divergence. So it turns out that in this limit where we're getting uh, good approximations to the posterior, the difference between KL and our mean squared error uh, metric doesn't matter at all. Right? They give the same recommendations. But also, importantly, the other differences do matter. Right? Both effective sample size and acceptance rate would say we should sample more from regions with high posterior. We should be on the right half of this plot. And that actually increases your uh, variance relative to rejection sampling and would make your algorithm worse. The optimum here is spending more of your effort on this uh, hypothesis with lower likelihood, that is less posterior, less uh, probable a posterior, right? So where did that intuition I was talking about in the beginning go wrong, right? We thought that these acceptance rate and effective sample size should be tracking the variance. I'll go through some of the uh, calculations behind the, that previous plot. And then after that, I have a few uh, comments about complications in practice that I think we don't have too much time about, but I'm happy to take questions about and discuss afterwards. So in this simple setting with discrete parameters and a finite probability of seeing exactly your data, right, we can write down um, what our uh, formula for the expected expectation of the f a function of interest would be. We can use the uh, delta method to calculate the asymptotic variance of this in the limit of um, infinite simulation budget. Finally, this is the limit of infinite simulation budget. It is not the limit of infinitely informative data. So the data can be still finite. 
with a little bit of algebra, you can just compute these and get a formula um, for the again, asymptotic variance as a function of your prior, your likelihood, and um, the number of simulations you put for each parameter value. And that is what I've put in this plot. Now, if we could rearrange this plot and directly compare the scores here, and so the green line here is one over the green line in the previous plot. The um, other dashed lines are in the recommendations from acceptance rate from the effective sample size. And as I was saying, those give sort of the opposite, not just recommendation, but the opposite direction of which way you should go relative to rejection sampling. Why did that happen? Well, this approximate variance uh, expression, or if you do a um, optimization with a Lagrange multiplier approach to find your optimal distribution, right, that has sort of three pieces to it. One, in blue, the prior, you should simulate more from places where right, that seemed more uh, plausible a priori. Two, not the likelihood, but sort of the standard deviation of the likelihood. Right? You want to simulate more from uh, parameter values where actually it takes more effort to learn the likelihood, where you need to put that budget to learn something. And then finally, the third term that's completely omitted in the acceptance rate or effective sample size is that this depends on the function that you want to estimate, that you should spend more effort on regions where inaccuracy of the likelihood would translate to inaccuracy in your expectation, and where uh, what that means then is where your function value is very different from its posterior mean uh, f bar. And then the simplified case of uh, two parameters, a bunch of those terms can actually drop out, and it turns out that no matter what your function is, um, no matter what your prior or likelihood is, you always should be simulating more from the less plausible parameter. But in general, it very much does depend on the function f that you are trying to estimate. So here on the left, I've put the prior in green is a flat prior, um, the like the posterior in the red dashed line is a Gaussian here. Although the plots are continuous, the simulations were done on a discretized version of this, so it's still in the um, discrete parameter setting where I derive those results. And depending on what function you want to estimate of the distribution of samples that maximizes efficiency can be very different. And some of these, I think, are, are generically, or can have intuitive explanations for them, like the one in the top right. This is effectively a 95% credible interval. What is the probability that your parameter is between minus two and two? And in order to get that, estimate that most accurately, uh, your simulation should be concentrated not in the region minus two to two, which is most uh, plausible on the posterior, but sort of in the higher likelihood regions just outside of that in the tails. And so, again, for estimating where your 95% credible interval it is, it really matters to understand what is going on in that 5% where no, um, your model is less likely. Simulating the, from the posterior sort of systematically performs poorly in the examples I've tried, often worse than the posterior. Optimizing for effective sample size or it's sort of inconsistent, depending on your function, it might perform well or poorly. There's just a few sort of complications that you would need to do in order to implement this in practice. One is that right, that optimal distribution depends on things that we don't know in the first place, right? We don't know the likelihood. We definitely don't know the posterior mean of f. But and again, in this discrete case, it's fairly straightforward to implement this as an adaptive scheme where right, you do some simulations, you get an initial estimate of your likelihood, initial estimate of that function expectation, and use that to decide where you're going to be doing your future simulations. And here, the green and purple sort of if you were doing the optimal from the beginning or if you were adapting to the optimal one, those two perform pretty similarly in examples. There's more complications in continuous parameters, right, because you no longer have the option of simulating at least once from every single uh, parameter value, but 
you now have to consider if we've only simulated from some of them, how do we approximate a continuous posterior? So there's more technical difficulties, but sort of qualitatively, I think the message is very similar um, that these uh, effective sample size and acceptance rate and other metrics are sort of sane heuristics, right? They aren't totally meaningless. On the left here, this is precision of estimating the mean in one example, and that's sort of clearly correlated with the effective sample size, though not perfect, right? If you were comparing a few of these algorithms by effective sample size, you'd get not quite the right order of which ones are better. But again, this depends quite wildly on what exactly you're trying to estimate. So on the right, this is the same uh, continuous example, but the mean is well estimated with these different variants of ABC, SMC. The covariance is sort of uh, terribly biased, and the fact that you are getting much higher effective sample size with uh, a few of the variants doesn't actually gain you anything in terms of uh, estimating the posterior covariance. So I, I hope you, I've convinced you, most importantly, that this is a question worth looking into, that you should pay attention to how you are measuring the performance of these algorithms, and that some of the sort of very intuitively plausible metrics are, don't hold up if you look at them more carefully. And then if you do look and you think through not just of how do I want to do this inference, but what do I want to use the results of my inference for? What do I want to learn from doing inference on this problem? Then there's room to adapt the inference algorithm to target that better. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Um, any questions? Silence. Uh, so I, I had a question. Yes. Uh, so if you're actually sort of doing this in, in some sort of real setting, what would a workflow actually look like to, to take advantage of these sort of efficiencies? Um, I think the main thing I am recommending in practice is sort of, say you're collaborating with some biologists on their inference problem, really talk to them from the beginning about right, what do they want to do with this information? Right? Are they looking for sort of something like a mean that's the um, right, parameter value they could use as sort of a rough guide of what they, whatever analysis they're following with? Or are they saying, okay, we want to rule out some regions of perimeter space that we no longer want to consider that looks more like right, trying to find credible intervals. Um, and so depending on what you, what the answer to those questions are, you could target different things with your simulations. And I guess the other thing that I want to recommend for the people who are more doing sort of algorithm development is sort of doing the, these sorts of analyses on examples where uh, you actually do have a ground truth and you can more rigorously an, uh, answer the question of how well is my algorithm doing rather than just doing the uh, demonstrating that it works on some complicated example where sort of the best thing you can do is say, oh, I did a simulation with this parameter, how close is my posterior mean to that, which doesn't necessarily capture is the posterior actually what it should be? So I can see how this works if you have a single output you're interested in, but what if I'm interested in and the mean and the variance? How right. do you modify what you've done? So um, I guess the question, the, the point is there's going to be some trade-off between those two. Um, one thing to mention in that direction is that this uh, does not all require the f assumption that f is a scalar function. Um, so one straightforward thing you could do is say, okay, I care this much about the mean, I care this much about the second moment, um, and put those in a vector and then do this with the norm of that. 
Hi, Adrian. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, how do your remarks about the performance of different heuristics um, de depend on cases where you do have a likelihood? Do you have the same conclusions about effective sample size and so on? So, so this is all likelihood free. This is all likelihood free. I think the sort of concerns about effective sample size, and in particular this formula for the effective sample size, do carry over. Um, that um, it's there's derivations of that formula sort of intended as an approximation to an error in uh, or variance of expectations that makes some sort of assumptions and disregards some error terms without good justifications for when or why those should be uh, negligible. And so I think the need to pay attention is still there. Um, some of the sort of specific results of having a formula for the variance, that is, I think is specific to likelihood free. Right. The point that you should simulate where you need to learn the likelihood it doesn't apply if you have a formula for the likelihood. Hey, thanks for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, I was wondering, I have two questions. The first one, if you consider also the Wasserstein distance, and if yes, whether it was different from the Kulbeck library or it was giving similar results. Yes, so that is a very good question. There are again, a huge range of different distances, um, and Wasserstein is a good one. Um, I think there's a, a class of distances, including the Wasserstein called integral probability metrics that can be written not as the um, distance or, or the expectation of a single function, but as the supremum over a class of functions. Um, and in that sense, they sort of still fit in this framework. Um, so you now have to consider sort of what is the class of functions that you are um, working with. With Wasserstein, in this particular examples, it would end up being exactly the same. Um, in slow dimensions, I think this is a very plausible thing to do. Um, one concerns with some of these other standard metrics is that it's fairly easy to come up with sort of pathological cases where it seems like they're not measuring what we want to, and often that they're too strict. So for Wasserstein, for example, if you're working in very high dimensions, um, the Wasserstein distance between empirical distribution and the continuous one sort of converges very slowly. And so you can have relatively high Wasserstein distance in high dimensions, even if for any particular function your error was relatively small. Or for another example, um, you could think about using a total variation distance, which is a supremum of uh, expectations of functions. And there again, I think it's uh, mathematically very uh, um, well motivated and tempting, um, but you also have concerns that maybe if you've chosen your class of functions to be too big, the sort of functions that give you that supremum are not what you care about. And so for an example of that, you could consider um, what if you ha are trying to approximate a posterior that's just a uh, standard Gaussian, and as your two approximations, you have one that, that's a Gaussian with mean one and uh, variance one, and one that's uh, approximation that is still a standard Gaussian um, that's sort of exactly the same as your posterior, except that your code was implemented in single precision instead of double precision. Right. And there, the total variation distance would be very high, right? because all you have to do is check whether the sample is single or double precision, even though I would argue that that's really a much better approximation to the posterior for the uses that we're likely to care about. So, so it's a good thought and, right, again, worth paying attention to these questions. Any, any remaining questions? If not, then let's uh, thank Aidan once, once again.